Again, the title of today's message is entitled Kingdom Vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Other translations may say, where there's no vision, the people perish. But the true, if you look into it, it says where there's no revelation, that word can also be dream or vision, the people will loosen restraints or cast off restraints, but happy is he who keeps the law. And some translations even say where there's no re revelation, the people cast off restraints and run wild. So those Greek words, those Hebrew words can mean several different things, but when you look into it, it's all saying the same thing. If we don't have a focus to where we're going, we won't get there. If we're not focused on where we want to be, we'll lack the discipline to get to where we want to go. So the question is, what is a vision? A vision or a vision statement is a short statement that describes the goals and ambitions of a person, church, or company. It encompasses their vision for the future in a way that reflects their core values and outlines their long-term goals. It's a big picture, something you can point to and it's somewhere where you need to go or want to go. It gives people a joining point. People that want to go with you. People that, people hire in their business. People that attend a church. It gives them a point to focus on where everyone's focusing on the same point. And it gives you something to focus on and shoot for. In simpler terms, a it's a statement that sums up where you want to be at some point in the future. A vision is very important because it keeps you focused. And if you're not focused, you have lack of focus and you normally don't get to where you're going. Have you ever been driving somewhere? Hold on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that for a second. How many people have been around like me before GPS and were driving before GPS? How many people remember having to get the road maps at all the rest areas when you got into the state? And then sometimes those road maps didn't have all the roads that you needed to go on. Let me ask you a question. What happens if you left the house and you said, hey, I'm going to drive to a particular location several states away, and you don't really know where it is. But instead of using GPS, you're just like, I'm just going to go where I think it's at and look for it. How successful do you think you'll be? Not very. I know sometimes when, even before they had GPS on the phone, they had those little Tom Tom or whatever they call them, different ones, and you'd had to buy those, and you were like, man, this thing's amazing. I don't have to stop and get a road map. But sometimes that would lead you in the wrong direction, right? See, even with a road map, you could find where you were going and you could get yourself in at least that general direction. It might take a pack of highlighters. A lot of stops. <laughs> then they had those road atlases where they, like, those were nicer, but you had to flip the page. Like, oh, my goodness, I'm going off the map. i got to flip the page. Anybody remember that? I love technology. I'm just saying that. 
I was working. I had a job where I had to go out of town sometimes, and I, they would send me with road atlases. I'm like, oh, my goodness, it was horrible. I had to drive the van to several different states, and it was, it was rough. But I had to ask for directions a lot. Anyway, the point is, if you don't have a place to focus on, if you don't have a place and address to know where you're going, it's going to be hard to get there, right? Even if you have a GPS, if you don't have an address, you're like, well, I could get in this general vicinity. But what if the person said, and, and you live out of state, and you said, hey, they live in Houston. You're like, that's like 300 square miles, you know? Like, you could get to the east side and still be 150 miles away from them. But the more and more focused you are on the point that you're going to, it's a lot easier to get to where you're going. Like what if they said, hey, I live in southwest Houston or central Houston or on the east side. It still gets you in a better direction than you were. That's what a vision does. It points you in the direction, and the more focused and specific the vision is, the more specific and easier it is to get to that point. If you have a general vision, you're going to get to a general location or a general place where you want to be. But if you're more specific, that vision will bring you to where you want to be if you're focused on that part and nothing else. See, if we have a vision and it's, if we say, look, we want to be here, and this is our vision statement, what's going to happen is, we're going to get more and more focused, and we're going to get to that point eventually. Amen? Because we're focusing on a point. Amen? People need to focus on something, and that's what a vision is for. And without a vision, people get off track. Like it says, people run wild. People cast off restraints, and some translations even say the people perish. And it but a vision causes people to push harder, to go further, to go further than they would without a vision statement. Amen? So today, we're going to talk about a kingdom vision. Amen? So turn with me to Mark 1. Mark 1, and we're going to start in verse 12. Mark 1. And we're going to start in verse 12. So at this point in the story, Jesus was gone to the desert. After he was baptized by John. And he goes into the desert to be tempted by the enemy. And we're going to pick it up at that point. So verse 12 says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And the chapter continues with Jesus beginning to call the disciples. Okay? But I want to back up and I want to go over verses 14 and 15 again. So Jesus says this, it says, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It says, Jesus came preaching the gospel, and he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. 
Okay, we're going to cover both of these, but I'm going to start with what Jesus said first. Oh, second, sorry. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. We're going to start with that first. The word at hand means to draw near, to be brought near, to join one thing to another. So if the kingdom of God is at hand, it stands to reason that prior to that point, the kingdom of God was not at hand, correct? Right? That means Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is near, but up to that point, it was not. Okay? In fact, not only was the kingdom of God not ruling, because it wasn't ruling, because Jesus said it was near, the kingdom of the enemy was ruling. Amen? Now, we're going to back up in Mark 1 and go to verse 5. Bless you, sir. So Mark 1, verse 5 says, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship, therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So the devil told Jesus, all of this has been given to me, and I will give it to you if you only bow down and worship me. That's not a lie. Everything had been given to him, and he was going to give it to Jesus. Okay? He was tempting Jesus with something that he was going to inherit anyway if he was patient. Which Jesus knew that. That's why he rejected it. So I'm not going to get into this now, but God gave Adam the rule and reign. I'm not going to go into detail on it. God gave Adam the rule and reign or the kingdom of the earth over the enemy. Okay? Adam was ruler on the earth. God told him that he had authority over everything. Okay? But when Adam sinned, he willingly gave that rights to the enemy. Okay? 1 Timothy 2.14 says that Eve was deceived, but Adam, Adam willingly sinned. Okay? Adam willingly sinned. Eve was deceived by the enemy, but Adam willingly sinned. Now get this. Adam willingly went against God, even though he knew it was wrong. Adam had rule and reign over everything, and then sin separated him from God. That's why he covered himself up, because he was ashamed of what he'd done. It wasn't necessarily because he was naked. He knew he was naked because he was ashamed of what he did. We talk about this all the time. His conscience condemned him. So no matter how much God loved him, he couldn't receive that love from God. So he was rejecting it because he was in sin at that point. Because he knowingly and willingly went against something that he knew was wrong and he did it anyway. That's sin. Jesus talks about this. If you know to do right and don't do it, that's sin. Eve was deceived, 
but Adam sinned willingly. See, we blame everything on Eve. Adam's the one that really did wrong. She was deceived. She didn't know any better. Adam didn't teach her right. Now, that's, that's a whole nother message. That's a whole nother message. Adam heard from God he should have been telling Eve. He should have been training Eve. He should have been taking care of his household first. Amen? But Adam knew it was wrong to partake, and he did it anyway. So stop blaming Eve for everything. Adam's the one that did it. Amen? Amen? You're like, blame the man. Hallelujah. <laughs> and at that moment, so when Jesus goes to, to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, okay? And he starts, blood starts pouring out of his pores. That's a, that's a real condition, and it happens in real life. You can get so stressed that the end of your capillaries will burst and you will sweat blood. Okay? It's under extreme stress, stressful conditions. But he said, Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, told God, not my will, but yours be done. What he was doing was he was making up for Adam's sin when Adam said in the Garden, not my your will, but mine be done. So that's where everything got messed up when Adam said, not your will, but mine be done. And Jesus corrected that, but Adam messed it up in the first place. Adam had everything he could have wanted or needed right there in front of him, and he chose to go after something else instead. Adam had everything that he wanted or needed and he chose to reject that to go after something he didn't even want and he didn't even need. That's what the enemy does. He knew it was bad and he did it anyway. But aren't you glad Jesus took back what Adam gave away? Amen? That's why he said the kingdom of God was at hand because he knew he was about to go to the cross and he was about to pay back everything that was taken. He's about to pay for our sins. He was going to take back everything the enemy took away. Amen? So, that's why Jesus was able to say the kingdom of God is at hand. Because he was looking ahead to the cross to sacrificing his life for ours. Amen? Amen? Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. Jesus established the kingdom of God in his death. Amen? Amen? And his resurrection. So when he said the kingdom of God is near. That's exactly what he was talking about. He started showing people on the earth. What they were about to be able to do after he left. And he even gave his disciples. The ability to do it. And the seventy. Not just the 12, the 70 as well. And then before he left, he told them, go into all the earth and tell them to go cast out demons, heal the sick. Freely they have been given, freely give. Okay? So that's the kingdom of God. Now turn with me to Luke 4, starting in verse 14. <laughs> This is the same point. The story sold in three different chapters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, about Jesus going into the desert, 
So in Luke 4, 14, this is right after Jesus returned from the desert. And Mark said he went into Galilee. And so Luke says he goes into Galilee, Galilee and then he goes into Nazareth. So Luke 4, starting in verse 14, says this, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through the all surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is, is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Or another way to say that is the kingdom of God is at hand. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I want to go back to verse 18 for a moment. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Anointed just means to appoint. Okay? So if God gives you something to do, the anointing means he gave you the ability, gave you the ability to do it. Okay? So if he appoints you to do something, the anointing follows that. Okay? But look at this. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. When you get appointed to do something, he gives you the ability to do it, but he also gives you his Spirit to make sure that it happens. See, when Jesus left and came back, he said he was going to send the comforter or the helper, the parakletos, which is the helper, to help you, to be with you, to be inside of you so you can accomplish anything that you need to do. Whatever it is that Jesus told you to do, he sent the Holy Spirit to help you accomplish it. It's not the Holy Spirit's job to accomplish it. It's the Holy Spirit's job to help you accomplish it. Okay? If he wanted to, he could have said, you know what, y'all just sit back and do nothing. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit out to do all this work. But he didn't do that. Because we're a part of the equation. The Holy Spirit's the helper, not the doer. We're the doers of the work, and he's the helper. If I need help, he helps me. Amen? But he says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. All this, when he said that word proclaim, it changed everything that he said because that word proclaim means a herald who goes ahead and tells people of news that's already been done. Notice Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed before Jesus ever even came to the earth. Amen? They were healing people by the stripes of Jesus before he ever came to the earth. Think about that. They're looking ahead 500, 1,000 years to Jesus' birth, death, burial, and resurrection. 
and saying that by his stripes we are healed before he was ever even born. Amen? Our job is to share the good news. That's it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The gospel, that word gospel means good news. Whatever good news you have, that's what you share. Be like, I ain't got no good news. Well, you need to spend time with Jesus more. You need to look back at your life and see what you've done. Because God changes everybody's life. If you ain't got no good news, just go back to what you did yesterday. Or knowing that you woke up this morning. Or how I'm not in prison. Amen? I'm just saying. Thank you. <laughs> he changes your life. You may not realize it every single day, but your life is totally changed. It may not be as drastic as my life or James's life or Lucinda's life. <laughs> Just because you see drastic change on the outside doesn't mean there's not drastic change on the inside. Because that's where I was changed more than on the outside. When I, was, when I gave my life to the Lord, my life changed because I changed on the inside. And because I changed on the inside, my life changed on the outside. I still had debts and stuff I had to take care of. I still had things I had to take care of with the uh, authorities, but I knew I wanted to get it done after that. He has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he's not saying poor as in money poor. He's saying poor in spirit. Those who are lost. You know, God brings you to people that you really don't want to talk to. I'm just going to tell you that. Those people that you can't stand, that's the one he's drawing you to. When you're sitting there and you say, gosh, darn, I hate these people. That's God drawing you to them. He's trying to change your character so that they can see the change inside of you. Amen? So don't scream at them. Don't yell at them. Find out why they're like that. And look in the mirror. God gave me something one, one time. I was talking about the body of Christ. And I, I'm not on a rabbit trail. This actually has something to do with today. So if someone irritates you, it's because they're just like you. Because if you think about this, a right arm and a left arm are just alike, but they're opposite. But if they work together, they can do a lot of work. Those people that you can't stand are probably the other side of the body to you. You're probably left and they're probably right. I don't know if you caught that, but. <laughs> or they're left and you're right. <laughs> He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. It doesn't take much to be a friend to someone. It takes nothing to call somebody, text somebody, to check on people. To proclaim liberty to the captives. 
Instead of speaking, speaking death over people, speak life over them. Stop telling people they're going to amount to nothing and tell them that they're blessed and highly favored. Tell them how much God loves them. Tell them that it doesn't matter what their life looks like up to now, but God can change it. It doesn't take much to start, turn around someone's life. Amen? Recovery of sight to the blind. Could be physical sight, could be spiritual sight, could be emotional sight. You introduce someone to Jesus, their eyes will be open. Physically and spiritually. I know when I got saved, I realized how stupid I was living. Amen? You realize all the dumb choices that you're making that three days before that you thought were amazing choices. How many people have ever done that? You're like, what was I thinking? And set at liberty all those who are oppressed. Oppression. Depression put on by someone else or themselves. There's tons of people that are oppressed out there. Just like that nefarious movie said, slaves are rampant in this world. And he's just talking about physical slaves. There's people in emotional slavery and physical slavery. There's people that uh, just get beat down and talked down to. And it doesn't take that much to help them out of it. Amen? Lift people up. Stop tearing them down. To set at liberty all those who are oppressed. So our job is to share the good news of the kingdom of God. To tell people what Jesus has done. That we were once blind, but now we see. Tell people that we were once lost, but now we're found. To tell people that we were once full of worry, but now we're at peace. To tell people that we used to be sinners and now we're saints, or saintish. Look, that's a joke. Whatever Jesus says about you is the truth, amen? Let God be true and every man a liar. So you're a saint, so stop calling yourself a saved sinner because you're, you're not. You're a saint. Tell people that you were once broken, but now you're healed because he set you free. Jesus did that for, for me, so I want to tell others about it. Why should I keep it a secret? Amen? Back to Mark 1 for one second. Verse 14, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Preaching the good news of the kingdom of God would soon be established. But our gospel is a little bit different because Jesus has already gone to the cross, died and rose again. So we don't serve a God that is about to do something. We serve a God that's already done something. Amen? Our gospel is that the kingdom of God has already been established. And we're living proof of that fact. Tell people, God can change my life. He can change yours. Amen? If God can cha change James's life, he can change yours. <laughs> so the kingdom of God has already been established. We just have to share that fact. And it's not about building a kingdom of yourself. 
It's about building God's kingdom. It's not about building a kingdom for your family. It's about building a kingdom of God. It's not about building a church denomination. It's about building a kingdom of God. It's not about building up new life. It's about building the kingdom of God. And if you build up his, his kingdom, he'll build up yours. Amen.